Hey there, folks. Good afternoon. The problem for today is a relatively short one, but the setup can be pretty tricky. At the end, I'll show you something helpful that we can do on a graphing calculator to save us some time. Here's a spring that's attached to the bottom of some surface. From the perspective of the spring, the bottom of its coil will represent y is equal to zero. If we stick a frame on the end of it, the spring will stretch downward some small distance in the minus y direction. And I'll call that initial stretch distance d sub i. And that's our 0 0.070 meters quantity from the first sentence here. But due to the way I've set up the coordinate system, its value will be negative. Next, we're going to drop a lump of putty onto this frame from a height of 30 centimeters, which will cause everything to move downwards towards the floor. Here's where the tricky part comes in. We can treat the combined objects of the putty and the frame as separate from the spring. And those two will view the floor as y is equal to zero in their perspective. When they reach that point, the spring will be stretched some additional length beyond d sub i, which we can call d sub f to represent the final stretch distance in that direction. And that variable is what we're trying to solve for. I know this can be a little confusing because we have two different locations here for y is equal to zero, but that's okay because it's for two separate objects that have completely different behaviors. The frame and the putty together want to fall to the ground under the influence of gravity. On the other hand, the spring wants to move upwards instead and snap back to its original length. That's why we're able to set two different zero points in the y direction for those. Let's put everything back and investigate the spring in the initial stretch position with just the frame on it. We're going to need the value of the spring constant, so let's draw the forces acting here. It's super simple. There's only two of them. The weight of the frame pointing downwards, and the spring force pointing in the opposite direction. Since the frame isn't moving before the putty is dropped, a sum of forces in the y direction will equal zero. And from here, we can move the weight over to the other side and then plug in the definitions of these two. Be sure to use d sub i as the displacement variable in the spring force, like this. Then we can divide both sides by d sub i to isolate k. What's nice is that if we plug in the values for these using negative signs on g and d sub i due to the coordinate system choice, k comes out to be exactly 21 newtons per meter which we can express using three significant figures to keep consistent with everything else. The next quantity we need is the impact velocity of the putty once it hits the frame. It's under the influence of a constant acceleration while it falls, which is gravity, so we can pull out the following kinematic equation. The putty is just dropped from rest, so the initial velocity squared term is zero. On the right-hand side of what remains, we know that g is negative, but be aware that delta y will be negative as well, since the putty is falling towards larger values of negative y. So those negative signs will cancel out and we're free to take the square root of both sides without encountering any trouble. However, remember that taking the square root of a positive number 
yields two results, positive or negative. And since the putty is falling in the minus y direction, it will have a negative velocity. So we need to take the negative result here to remain consistent with the coordinate system choice. Since the putty collides with the frame and sticks to it, what we have here is essentially an inelastic collision, which means that momentum is conserved during the collision and then mechanical energy is conserved after. Let's start with momentum. Instantly before the collision, all of the momentum will come entirely from the putty since the frame isn't initially moving. And the momentum instantly after the collision will come from the combination of both objects. There's a negative on both sides here since the putty's contact velocity is downward. And so is the velocity of both objects after. But we can cancel it out on both sides for now. Here I'm calling the total mass of the frame and the putty capital M. The velocity of that composite object is capital V, which we'll solve for by dividing both sides by capital M. If we plug in that previous definition for the impact velocity of the putty, which contains a negative sign, now the velocity of our composite object is consistent with our coordinate system. With the momentum taken care of, we can move on to the conservation of energy and see what we can eliminate here. Once these two combined objects start to move towards the floor, there's no frictional interaction or anything weird doing work on them. So the other work term can be set to zero. Also, once the frame and the putty hit the floor, they can't continue to move. So the kinetic energy has to be zero there as well. Here's what remains. Our potential energy term on the left contains two contributions. One from the potential energy stored in the spring when it's initially stretched to d sub i, and the other from the potential energy of position of the frame and the putty together. Speaking of potential energy of position, notice that we had to express the height of the combined putty and frame objects in terms of the final stretch distance of the spring. Thankfully, the negative signs between g and d sub f cancel out, and we get the proper positive sign for this potential energy term that we should. On the right, our displacement variable in the spring potential energy now accounts for the total stretch distance, which is the sum of the individual stretch distances of d sub i and d sub f. Let's start here by foiling this squared piece on the right. And I'll distribute the 1 half k coefficient to everything inside the parentheses. Here's what we get. Notice that we have the same term on both sides. This one and this one here. Let's go ahead and subtract those out and keep going by multiplying both sides by two to get rid of these one halves. Remember, we want to solve for d sub f. And if you look closely, there's a quadratic of d sub f hidden in this equation at the bottom. Let's move everything over to the left-hand side and write it in descending powers of that variable, like this. To make it even more obvious that we have a quadratic here, I'll group everything up using some parentheses. Unlike easy quadratic equations, this isn't something that we can just quickly factor and then figure out. Instead, we'll have to utilize the quadratic formula. Here's our a 
B and C terms, plus a reminder of the quadratic formula in case you forgot it. Now, instead of spending the next five to 10 minutes doing algebra here, let's look at a really fast way to solve this using a graphing calculator. Here's the kind of calculator that I have, a TI-84. And there's a really cool app that it comes with to help us solve quadratic equations. If you have a different kind of calculator, you'll have to check and see if it has the same functionality as this one. Let's start by pressing the Apps button. And you'll get a list of apps that come pre-installed on the device. And the specific app that we're looking for is the fourth one on the list. Go ahead and start it up and press the enter button once this title screen appears. We're going to select the first option, polynomial root finder, to get the roots of this quadratic expression. You shouldn't have to change any settings in this configuration, but in case yours defaults to something different, make sure it's set to what you see here. In the third row, some calculators have auto and decimal instead of decimal and fraction. You can leave it on auto if yours has that selected. With the configuration set, we're good to continue. So go ahead and press the graph button at the top right here underneath the next. For this program, the calculator doesn't use the notion of capital A, B, and C for the terms. Instead, it uses A2, A1, and A0, but it's the same thing. For A2, we're going to use our value of capital A, which is negative 21, and then press Enter. For A1, I'm going to enter the expression for capital B using some parentheses to be safe, like this. So we have 2 times the total mass, which is 0 0.350. And we're going to multiply that by g, which is negative 9.8. We're going to end the parentheses there and then subtract the second quantity, which is 2 times positive k, so 21. And then we're going to multiply that by d sub i, which is negative 0.070 close off the parentheses and then press enter. You should be getting negative 3.92. The last one is A0, which represents capital C. Let's go ahead and punch that one in next. Remember we have the total mass M, which is 0 0.350 times capital V squared. Here's how we'll enter that. I'm going to set up two sets of parentheses because we're taking the mass of the putty which is 0 0.200 dividing that by the total mass 0 0.350 we're closing that off and I'm going to multiply that ratio by a negative square root of 2 times g so negative 9.8 times the uh, delta y value in meters. So negative 0 0.3. And then we'll close that off and then close the second one and square it. And hopefully I enter that correctly. And you should get positive 0 0.672. When we press this graph button again to solve this quadratic expression, we get the roots. Let's go ahead and grab these. And I'll go back to the PowerPoint format like this. Here's what we got on the calculator. And since D sub F needs to be negative, we'll go ahead and throw away this positive result. So in the end, we get a final stretch distance of 0 0.295 meters in the downward direction. And with that, we're done. Thanks for watching.